Now, I know we've spoken it today, but before today, were you familiar with the idea of transfiguration? How many of you are familiar with that? Oh, lots of you. Okay, good. Well, we're done then. Because <laughs> that's what I was going to tell you about. <laughs> but maybe, maybe we'll look at it in a new way. Should I tell you anyway? Okay. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> shamans say, some shamans say, that if you know that you're a hawk, you can transform yourself or transfigure yourself into a hawk or a cat or whatever it is that you want to. Now, this may feel like way out woo-woo magic to you today, but transfiguration is this very essence of kind of a shape-shifting, a, a changing, a change in countenance, a change in the way that we appear. And because nothing is really solid, even though it so appears, there is this constant movement of energy that can reshape itself, reform itself, and then go back out into the ethers and reshape and reform itself again. It's all energy, right? So we're going to look today at the transfiguration and also the experience that Jesus had during the transfiguration of his own being. The point is not necessarily to change ourselves into cats or hawks. But the, well, it could be, <laughs> it can be, it's your transfiguration. <laughs> we honor everybody's path here. But, <laughs> but the point is more that we realize that we are more than we realize. You see, you know, we are more than we realize. We are so much more than the solidity that we think the world is made of, that there is this movement all the time of light creating and recreating, and that we participate in that, and that our beings are infused with that truth. So I want to turn to the scriptures again and, and take a look at this. And remember, last week we looked at the story of Moses. Last week we looked at the aspect in this series of resurrecting the cosmic Christ, of, of uh, the, this, the process of service, of here I am, you know, that Moses made himself available. And that whole experience happened to Moses on a mountaintop. So remember, whenever we go to the mountaintop, it's signifying that higher plane of consciousness. And so there's Moses on the higher plane of consciousness, yet Moses is in relationship with God. So he's having a conversation with God in the burning bush. Still phenomenon going on there, but it's a relationship. What happens then, it takes a long time, is another spiritual teacher comes along who isn't in relationship with God, but one with God. Right? Remember, Jesus would always say, I and the Father are one. Or I am the vine. You know, he, all the I am sayings. So that... so. God was trying to send Moses down the mountain to his people to say, I am sent me, so that he could begin to know himself as that divinity. But that, it was like too soon for us, you know? <laughs> and it might feel too soon for you today even, you know? Because we're always in that evolutionary process. But Jesus came along and said, I get it. I am that I am. I am the one, I am who I am sent me, and I am that and showed us how to be that oneness, right? So in his experience of going to the mountaintop, which there were a few, but in this particular story, he goes to the mountaintop and he brings three disciples with him. Whenever he's going to do something really important, he brings these three disciples, Peter, James, and John. Why does he bring those three? Because in the 12 powers, as, our, as we understand it in unity, those three represent faith, wisdom, and love. So if you've got something big going on, you're going to want to draw forth or activate those three energies within you, those three spiritual qualities. Bring the best that you can of your wisdom so you can discern the situation because we're not really sure what's going to happen here. We're walking into our first day of transfiguration class. You know, so not, not quite sure what's, who's going to change or what's going to change or what's going to happen here, right? And then we want to bring love always, right? We always want the companionship of love, of the divine love that comforts, that, that allows us to know the truth, that connects, that reminds us, that makes us feel a sense of safety. And then, and then we also want our faith, right? That rock, that sense of knowing, that sense of I, I, this, God's with me. I got this. I am that. I can be that. And so that's what he brings because 
He knows something's going to happen. There's nothing in the scriptures that indicates he knows what's going to happen, but that he is guided to go to the mountaintop, and so he does. So I just want to read to you what actually happens. So it's, this is from Matthew 17, and um, Jan reflected a little bit of that in her reading. So it says, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up to the high mountain, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Then Moses and Elijah appeared, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I will make dwellings for you here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, this big cloud comes over them overshadowing them, a bright cloud. And from the cloud comes a voice saying, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and they were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and he touched them and he said, get up, do not be afraid. And they looked up and saw no one there except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus said, tell no one about this vision until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Now, what the heck happened? (laughs) So there was this transfiguration, this visible experience of the radiance of the divine coming through a human being. You ever experienced that? You ever see somebody look more radiant than they did maybe a moment ago or a day ago or something happens and you see that radiant countenance, that look upon their face? That's it. And then there's that sort of maybe even shining, brilliant light, a kind of sense of radiant light. You know, we can see that more easily if we stop looking with a hard focus and look with a soft focus. When you, fo- when you let your eyes relax into a soft focus, it opens up to be able to see more of energy. So you may sometimes see auras and that kind of thing, or around living beings, or you know, could be around a chair, because that's a living being too. Um, but you, know, you might be able to start to see more of that radiant, dazzling light that is there around every living thing, because it's vibrating with the divinity. It is made of that cosmic Christ, and it's able to shine through that cosmic Christ. And we, too, are able to transfigure ourselves, to move ourselves from one kind of countenance, one kind of way of being in the world, to showing up in a whole different way. The the key is it kind of happens through us, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when we see, it's like the invisible now becomes visible when we see in this way. And we see from that mountaintop kind of view, right? That higher plane of consciousness that we've moved to. Sometimes in our earthly life, we see in a different way when we're at the kitchen table point of view. Anybody ever have some really important things happen around a kitchen table? It's where it all happens, right? Really? Isn't it? The best of conversations, the breaking of bread, the sharing of food, the connection, the real heart kind of centered experiences that happen. One day, my friend Cynthia and I were sitting at her kitchen table. Now, Cynthia and I would always say when we went on outings together or got together really at any time that it was going to be a magical mystery tour. Magical metaphysical mystery tour or magical mystical, you know, it had any of those words in it because things happened when we got together. I mean, I don't know what it was, but something about our energies together, really cool things happened when we were in each other's presence. And I'm just laughing because I'm now thinking about some of the craziness that went on. But I want to tell you about one of the exam- one of the experiences when I was sitting at her kitchen table. So just a few weeks before, I had received this thing in the mail. It was a picture on paper of Jesus' image, kind of like the image you see of the shroud. So it's kind of more that fuzzier image, but you can tell it's supposed to be Jesus as we know him in the art that we've seen. And it had instructions. It didn't have any um, return address, so I didn't know where it came from. I assumed it came from some kind of local church. And the instructions were to unfold it. It looked like a rug, and, and, but it was paper, and to kneel on it and to say prayers on this rug. 
Well, I had, I thought it was interesting, so I kept that part and just kind of put it aside, but I didn't do anything with it. So I'm over at Cynthia's, and it's pinned to the wall in her kitchen. Now, Cynthia has had some really powerful experience with Jesus. So she, Jesus is really an important master teacher for her. She had an experience where it was a vision where she saw him in a field. And then after that, she had something like an enlightenment experience that lasted for a couple of weeks where she was just in this divine state that was a, a, a very shape-shifted, transfigured, completely kind of state that she stayed in for a couple of weeks. Kind of like Eckhart, if you know Eckhart Tolle's story, kind of like what he talks about, how he was completely shifted and he was like on a park bench until he kind of took up his new identity. And so it was like that for her for a couple of weeks, just experiences of, of being fully in, immersed in the divinity. So that's probably part of the reason why she pinned it up because of that, that feeling and that experience. So we're just sitting there talking, and we begin to look at it. And I said, you know, oh, I got this in the mail too. And as we were looking at it and talking, something started to happen. The face started to change. And it would change into another being's face, and then another being's face, and then another being's face. And it became just this really amazing experience of the face of the Christ through time. It was, I mean, and we saw some of the same things afterwards. We were, and actually during it, we were talking a little bit. I was, I was surprised at some of the things I saw. I saw soldiers. I saw soldiers from the Civil War in that kind of garb. I saw uh, women from the like 1800s that looked, you know, very well dressed. And I saw men with heavy beards from Middle East and and darker skin. And and she saw more Native American and Buddhist. But we saw a lot of the same kinds of images. Too, and there was a lot of crossover. And this went on. I mean, this maybe started like around dinner time, and we just like stayed with it till like one or two in the morning when we finally got too tired and just went to bed because it just kept coming. I mean, it was face after face after face after face. And it was so engaging and enthralling because it was clear to us that what both of us that we were seeing is, and that we were both having this experience simultaneously. I mean, how often do you get to do that? Usually if we have this kind of experience, we're looking around to tell somebody and it's like you just don't have the words, right, to ever explain it to anyone. But if you get to experience it with someone like Peter, James, and John, who got to stand there and see that radiance unveiled for them, there was a different kind of synergy to that. And so it is for us as people in spiritual community that we get to behold these kinds of changes, these transfigurations of one another with each other. That is a really beautiful gift to be in spiritual community with one another and to be able to allow ourselves to go to those deeper places. Yes, we all love to be in community to socialize with one another, but we're also all here for a much deeper purpose, right? You wouldn't be here in this community if all you wanted was a social experience. What you want is a spiritual experience with community. What you want is that kind of experience side by side that really lets you know that we are more than we realize we are. And to remember that together, to see that together, to behold that together is such a gift, isn't it? So what's important when we have these experiences is that we don't think just because we've had an experience of some kind of phenomenon that we want to cling to it in some way, right? So, so that experience doesn't, doesn't mean that it was something special that happened for just Cynthia and I. It happened because it was something that we needed to experience, just like, you know, if nothing ever happens to you of this nature, you probably don't need it. <laughs> So it's not like it, you know, so it's important that we don't cling to things and make them something and then build it in our ego as something important. You know, if, if Peter did this in a really visceral way, in a really literal way, right? So there they are having this amazing experience. Jesus is showing them this, or it's coming through him, this radiance divinity, he, this experience of the white light. And what does Peter say? Good thing we're here because we can build a dwelling for you and for Moses and for Elijah. 
You know, it's kind of like last week's we talked about service. It's like the overdoing aspect of that, right? <laughs> that it's like, okay, now you're in the midst of this transcendent spiritual experience and you want to pin it to the earth. You know? <laughs> Got to make it physical. Got to put it in a container, you know? And so that's kind of sometimes what we do, isn't it? So it's that clinging. It's that, and, and, you know, and as soon as he does that, you know, Moses and Elijah disappear. The cloud comes over and, and God reminds them this is about Jesus and it's about all of us. And it's about reminding us that you are my beloved in whom I am well pleased. And when we can receive that fully, know that, that we are the beloved and the divine is well pleased that we get it, that we're waking up, that we're being this, and that divine light shines through us. And then everybody can see and behold that divinity, not to make you special, but to recognize who we are, all of us. So that's why the transfiguration is so important, because it is about the visible shift that happens and the recognition of what has happened. The recognition of that, the realization of what that means for us. That we are not just this this dwelling place, (laughs) but there is like the tents that he wants to build, there's an over-tenting thing that happens, right? That blows that apart, that says, no, 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 this isn't about getting physical right now. This is about you recognizing the fullness, the energy, the power, the light, the divine love that you are. So when we move away then from that clinging, we can see some other ways to do things. You know, when, when Peter does that, it's kind of like the old adage, don't just stand there, do something. That's kind of what he's operating from, you know? But actually in spirituality sometimes, it's don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> right? or sit there, or be there, or lie down on the earth and allow the sun to remind you of the divine rays that you are made of, or the stardust that you are made of in the evening. So that in nature, we see examples of this, to bring it down to earth a little bit more. You know, have you ever seen a, a snake shed its skin? Yeah, it's an amazing thing to watch. So does, do you ever see the snake sort of trying to get back in the skin, like shimmying back? No, it's so happy and knows what it's supposed to do. And it, and it gladly and un, it, without resistance just helps wiggle out of that which wants to be shed. And so it's for us, too, that, that we get attached to the old ways of being. But as we, whatever word you wish, shapeshift, transfigure, transform, transmute, all of these things are cousins of one another. And, and as we are moving in those directions, we need to be like the snake to sort of like wiggle off that old way of being. Because what comes out if you've gotten to watch that is that the snake is like sleek and shiny and beautiful and the colors are more vibrant. And it, is, it seems reborn right before us. And that's what we do over and over again. Or like the caterpillar that completely transfigures, that completely transfigures itself and leaves behind its old body and its old way of being. It used to crawl around on leaves and on the ground, and now it's become a winged thing. It's completely transformed and come into that transcendent big picture kind of creature. And so for us, we too, I think we have a butterfly there somewhere, and that there is a beautiful one. And so that's what we become, right? So does the caterpillar go, oh, no, I can't do that, you know? (laughs) Not getting in the cocoon, nope, (laughs) you know? It just allows. And so over and over again, we are shown by the spiritual masters and by the the masters of the planet, the, the creatures, how to be, how to allow, how to surrender, how to give over to the one that wants to radiate and be known through us. And to see with the kind of eyes that can see what is happening in us and through us and to one another. And to reflect that back. So there is that critical mass idea that one 
wakes up and then another wakes up and enough of us wake up and enough of us are in the radiant light of God. Enough of us are transfigured at one time or another that the shift of the whole planet happens. And then we all remember who we are. That's really why we're here anyway, isn't it? To shift it all into that remembrance of who we are. The healer Lauren Torres says that when she's doing her healing work, she looks to the place where the, where the weaving happens. So she looks to the place where something was woven, where the energy of weaving happens. So instead of, say, like, say if she's working with somebody, instead of like seeing their solid body or say she was working with like a, um, maybe an injury or a tumor or something like that, instead of seeing it in that solid place, she looks instead to where the energy was woven. Does it make sense? So like or a little earlier or a little open space. It's kind of like my arm. So many of you know that I uh, fractured my arm a couple months ago and it's still healing. And, you know, for me, I, I'm really affirming and working with this as a transfiguration experience. And it's really cool to see the process and to learn about the process. So I'm sitting there with the doctor. I see the x-ray. You know, there's gaps where the bone is fractured in the early stage. And then we look at the next x-ray and it's starting to fill in. And what happens is the body actually weaves a new bone. That is so fascinating, isn't it? So, so it's, if I can go into the weave of where it is being woven, I can put in that weave my prayers of intention. So the right side of the body is the masculine side. It's the it's the energy, it's the action, it's the thing we're doing and doing and doing in the world, right? And so if in the weaving place, I can place my prayers of ease, my prayers of joy, my prayers of simple pleasures, my prayers of openness and energy and movement, rather than, you know, that kind of energy, then that intention will transfigure me on its own. I believe that. So that's a little bit of working with our co-creative principle and the allowing piece, you know, having a little bit of an intention behind it and a giving over. It's more like how Jesus went into the crucifixion and resurrection, knowing those things were going to happen, but yet having to give over to it. And so it's kind of the same process for us. We may have some inkling or intention involved, but there's still a giving over. There's still a letting go. There's still an allowing, like the caterpillar or the snake. So, and there's also that experience of, you know, you, you, many of you um, shook your heads when I said, have you seen somebody radiant uh, before or changed to a radiant countenance? A lot of times that happens for people near death. If you've experienced that before where somebody can even come, become kind of like translucent almost. Has anybody experienced that kind of radiance near death? Yeah, many of you. And so that, that beautiful gift that that being gives you to see them in that way is a, is a transfiguration experience. What's happened for that person is they've given over, right? They've allowed, they, that survival instinct is now beginning to fall away. And it's not just a bodily survival instinct, but actually what we hold to the most in our culture now is more psychological survival, more the ego survival. And so it's the giving over of that as well right? We are not in control. It's giving that over. I know it's always bad news. Just, I always try to give it time to land for me too, (laughs) because it's good news. It's really good news because as we give over, we open up, we're more at ease, we're more allowing, we're more spontaneous, we're more alive, we're more heart-centered, we're more in the flow of the divine. And so it will naturally happen that our countenance will shift to that and give that gift to others everywhere we go just simply by beholding the presence. Like we would behold that magical butterfly and say, there has to be a God when we see those colors and that brilliance and that beauty and to think that it has transfigured from this little creature that was crawling along. Still cute, little furry caterpillar. (laughs) Not saying that. (laughs) And so, so it is for us, this, this shifting, this changing for, and it doesn't have to be, you know, near death. That's the point. It doesn't have to be that we wait until our final days to surrender over some of this instinct that says, I must stay alive. I must be in control. I must, you know, which is kind of what the ego 
does. It's like it's it's in fear and it wants to manage things, but but it just it can be a slow process of just giving over and giving over and giving over and allowing that transfiguration to happen through us. It doesn't have to be anything instantaneous or phenomenal in, in a sense. Adya Shanti says in Resurrecting Jesus, the divine presence is no longer obscured by the view of unconsciousness in this transfiguration process. Such a one is no longer primarily a person, but a presence. That's really what we're coming to. We're shifting from being a person to being a presence. Very different, right? You know when you're in the presence of someone who's really being that true presence, that authentic presence, or a person, a personality, a persona. Very different. He says, the personhood has been rendered transparent to the light of truth, the shining of the divine being. In the Gospel of Thomas, it talks about, I am everything. I am the light above everything. I am everything. Everything came forth from me, and everything reached me. It's back into the cosmos of the Christ, right? I am that I am from the very beginning, and I am right now as I sit here at Unity of Walnut Creek. I am the I am. And when I shift to knowing that I am the I am, it's like, ah, everything's going to be okay. In fact, everything is brilliant. Everything is amazing. Everything is alive. Everything is exciting. I'm really glad to be here. We elevate in our consciousness, in our desire to be a part of this process of transfiguring our entire planet. Are you ready to do it? Yeah, we are that. We are the cosmic Christ. We are being transfigured, one beautiful, radiant face at a time. Let's know this together. Let's affirm the truth of this transfiguration and this luminous light that each of us are as a cosmic Christ. Together, I am the transfigured, luminous light of the cosmic Christ. I see it. Bless you.